Hey everyone, and welcome to this special training uh, with Mike Hardington, who is the director of DevRel at Ionic. Hi, Mike. Hello. You get to work on so many fun projects like Ionic Capacitor, Stencil. You're just like leading all the DevRel initiatives there. Yeah, trying to make sure that we uh, we communicate to people what we're doing. Well, a lot of people have been adopting Capacitor. I've had some great conversations about like, what do we do next? Oh, let's, we're using Capacitor. What do you guys think of that? I know you and I have, I have had some conversations about that too. So I'm so excited for you to like dive in and, you know, convince everybody why Capacitor is like the best thing on earth. I think it is, <laughs> uh, but I'm biased. <laughs> Well, if you don't know Mike, you can follow him on Twitter at, it's at M Hartington, right? Yes. On Twitter. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you get started. Cool. All right. So let's go ahead, do a quick little share and get that all situated. We can see it. Looks good. Perfect. Now's the window management on screen too. All right, um, so we'll just dive right into it. So we're gonna be talking about Capacitor today. Uh, Capacitor is a uh, library runtime. It's a couple different things. It's a project for building uh, cross-platform apps uh, with web technologies. Now, before we dive into the actual Capacitor side of the technology, let's kind of define uh, cross-platform as a term. Uh, it is literally just a approach to building something that is um, taking an abstraction, whether it's a different language or a different tool set, and letting that tool set be your common ground to then apply that to different platforms. Um, if we think about the gaming industry, no one's writing a, uh, a PlayStation game, an Xbox game, a Switch game, than a Steam game. They're all writing in a higher level abstraction um, where they can then go ahead and take that abstracted code base and have a version that runs for all those platforms. So this is something that's super common in the gaming industry. It's also very common in the mobile app industry because it's just a pain to build for uh, native iOS, native Android, as well as having a uh, good web platform presence. So cross-platform in this regard is sent to consolidate all of those different platforms into one code base and letting us build for, for them using some abstraction. So we need to reduce how much knowledge that we have uh, by learning that one abstraction, we can get rid of needing to know the finer details of iOS programming, uh, Android programming, we can reduce the amount of code that we need to actually author ourselves because we are using some libraries that can help translate what our, our JavaScript calls or some other language uh, for the particular runtime. And obviously, if we're thinking about today's economy, uh, getting to market really quick is super important. So we should be reducing the time it takes for us to actually ship something. So there is a spectrum of how I like to think about this, uh, where you have one side being the pure web approach, where you are doing literally nothing other than writing uh, a web app. And then there is the pure native approach, which is you are doing literally nothing to build a web app, but only build a native app. Uh, we've seen uh, pretty, pretty large uh, companies try to do only a native app and it's only available on the app. and quickly uh, falls out of fashion. Um, but there are different steps from each of these uh, extremes that people probably are familiar with. For example, Cordova is probably the one that first comes to mind. Uh, originally it was called PhoneGap. Uh, then it was renamed because people like to, like to keep everyone on their toes. Uh, but it was the original approach to doing some kind of cross-platform uh, where they popularized the idea of write once, run anywhere for web apps. Uh, they give you a abstraction where it's just a JavaScript 
but then they will polyfill uh, these emerging standards at the time. Um, so that way, whatever it was to get your geolocation or to get a photo, um, there would be some upcoming spec that they would implement in their runtime and then translate the native code uh, uh, to actually perform that action. So for example, uh, at some point in time, there was this idea that to take a photo on the web, you would have this navigator.camera object. Uh, and this camera object would have a method called get picture. And then you would have a success callback, a fail callback, and then some uh, options that you could pass into it. Now, this would spin up a new camera activity or a new camera view, let you take the photo, and then depending on how you configure that, it could either return uh, a base64 string or it could return a data URL or data URI of the actual image that uh, was just captured. Now, this was an idea, but as we are here in, uh, you know, modern times, navigator.camera does not exist. Uh, neither does this uh, camera.destination type data URL. Um, none of these things actually ended up getting shipped. And they were very specific to the Cordova runtime. This was just an idea that they thought would eventually ship. Now, that was for camera, but there was a huge ecosystem of plugins and packages uh, out there that would do uh, similar things for different APIs. So geolocation, file system, Bluetooth, uh, basically any kind of core device functionality was created as these custom packages. Um, and due to the historical nature of this, custom packages were shipped before we actually had uh, MPM basically uh, as our default package manager. So they were downloaded as zips, they were downloaded uh, straight from GitHub, and they relied on custom build scripts and release processes that didn't scale well once your team grew to more than just you. So if you were pairing with uh, a couple people or if it was a small consultancy, having more teams, uh, team members were kind of given up, uh, you felt the pain pretty quickly. Now, additional notes on Cordova is that it tried to do the thing as making the web uh, the eventual goal for everything. Um, the Cordova project itself was trying to be a, uh, a polyfill for all these native functionalities. They didn't really want to actually exist, nor did they want to be able to do all this stuff. They'd rather just build web apps. Um, they tried to hide a lot of the complexity of the native project, so you didn't really need to know anything about Xcode or Android Studio. Or I guess at the time it was Eclipse. That doesn't scare anybody. Uh, I don't know what will. But they tried to hide all of these uh, lower level details. And what you would see is that people would just try to ignore that because the lower level details really mattered uh, as you were starting to build something, you know, real. Uh, you needed to have access to new features like adding entitlements to your apps. You needed to be able to add signing certificates. All these kind of come things that native apps had, Cordova tried to hide away and people uh, were not thrilled about it. So if that was the one step from building a web app, uh, we'll see the other side. Uh, and this is compiled to native approach. Uh, they saw how Cordova would work and some other solutions, and they're like, that's a terrible solution. Those really don't scale well, uh, especially when you try to think about production. So what if we had this learn once, write anywhere app, uh, write anywhere uh, idea, where instead of having to uh, think, if I knew one abstraction, I could write for any platform, and then the platform specific details become very minimal. So you would have an example would be React Native. The amount of times that you actually see a truly React Native where they don't dip into the pure um, native uh, ecosystem is pretty minimal. Most people are mixing in a lot of the native platform 
implementation details with a little bit of React Native here and there. But they had this, had this promise of shipping a truly native app uh, and actually shipped some pretty good things like a standard library around file system operations so that way you weren't reliant on a third-party API or community updates to uh, get access to certain things. Um, they provided all that kind of out of the box. You know, kind of architecturally how it worked was that you would have your, your JavaScript app uh, running in some sort of um, JavaScript runtime, essentially a node wrapper that would then proxy out calls from the JavaScript process to the actual implementation details. So this bridge layer would go ahead, take the calls from the node runtime, go out to the render a button, call the camera process, it would proxy all of these calls for you. So that way your small JavaScript app was just one part of it, but it was actually handling how the uh, full rendering of components would be done, how accessing those native features were done. Uh, where this kind of broke down though, is jumping from a web first approach to something like React Native, it's not as easy as everybody uh, says it is. Um, for example, you're no longer dealing with standard CSS, uh, standard um, HTML elements. Uh, you're dealing with custom stuff that is particular to mobile. Um, and it doesn't tra always translate well where you see here's the uh, HTML and then here's the equivalent um, React Native code. Uh, if you had an existing web app, uh, the ability to reuse some of that was actually pretty slim. Um, you couldn't just render the existing web app inside of a React Native app. You would have to rewrite par uh, parts of it. And then if you were using any co uh, common third-party libraries, those just did not uh, work. Um, you would have to find React Native specific ones uh, for that uh, feature that you wanted to add. For example, charts or rich text. Um, and the idea of it being truly native to me is a little bit misleading. Uh, in React Native, all these controls are rendered on the fly. So the JavaScript is still there and it's still doing a lot of the work behind the scenes. Uh, and in other cases for things like Flutter, they're not even using the true uh, components. They're actually rendering everything through some uh, through some rendering engine that is going through and drawing out all those components and hoping that they match the platform styles. So truly native is kind of an overrated term um, and really not an accurate description of these two. So we're going to look, obviously those, that was the extreme from one step removed from native. And then we had the one step removed from the web. Obviously we're going to look at what I think lands right in the middle. Uh, and that is Capacitor. Now, as I said, Capacitor is a native runtime. Uh, gives you a uh, ability to expose native functionality through your web app. And it does this with a couple of different uh, libraries that we will install. When you wanted to go ahead and call something like a camera API, there is a uh, specific implementation for iOS, for Android, and the web. Um, all of that becomes an abstraction detail that you don't ever have to worry about. Uh, you just get one consistent API that will handle adapting to each of those platforms. And then also uh, it uses standard native tooling. So the way that your apps end up getting built are the same way that purely native apps get built. Um, there's no custom scripts or custom uh, tools needed. However, a native app can be built. That's how your capacitor app is built. Now, this actually looks pretty similar to how uh, React Native uh, is architected. If the only difference is that we are also building the UI. So you are rendering things inside of an enhanced uh, web view. But this isn't the same kind of web view that I think a lot of people might be familiar with from Cordova experience. Um, this has been highly optimized for speed and performance. Uh, it uses the modern uh, rendering engines on each of the platforms. 
and has a very, very fast um, operation layer from calling the native system call and then returning those values to the web view. So this is a uh, much faster and more consistent web view than I think a lot of people are uh, used to dealing with. Now, this does let you take an existing web app uh, and just sprinkle in a little bit of capacitor and then you can ship that to the store. I would argue maybe don't do that. Uh, maybe build a version that looks right for mobile, but you could just take any old web app that's out there, um, drop a capacitor in it, and it would work. Uh, the runtime for this is going to become uh, available instantly. So as soon as that app is loaded, you can start to call native um, native code right away. Uh, and you can e easily jump down a level and actually write your own native code uh, before the app actually launches. And um, we'll take a look at some of that. Uh, and as I said, uh, we were using, uh, we're using standard native tooling. Uh, we're also following native best practices. So all your projects will go ahead and be using the same uh, formatters, the same code style as are uh, officially recommended by both Apple and Google. So that's all we're going to focus on for slides. Um, we're going to actually look into some code here. Uh, and to first get started, uh, we are going to actually uh, create a new, a new web app. Um, so let's go ahead and I'm just going to do a quick little uh, project here with bun and Vite. Uh, we'll call this JS drops. Um, I'm just going to use React just because, uh, and I'm going to do TypeScript because I like TypeScript. And then we'll just do a quick little install. And then let's run our dev environment. Okay. Do some window management, local host 5173. Okay, so here is uh, our app running. Um, nothing about this should seem too drastic. Let's see what we got in the chat. Um, we have essentially, we have our app. .tsx, so all this is uh, everything that we should be used to seeing. So, yep, that is a working React and Vite project. Nothing really here to uh, see that is, um, that shouldn't be familiar to people who have done uh, React before. Let's go ahead and actually uh, implement um, the capacitor side of thing. So for this, we're going to install at capacitor CLI and at capacitor core. So these are our two main libraries that we're going to need to get started. Obviously, core is going to give us the core runtime, pretty self-explanatory. And then CLI is going to give us our project specific CLI. So we, every project is going to have their own CLI uh, instant. So that way, if for some reason you're on capacitor uh, five point whatever, if we were to come out with 6.0 and you start a new project, you can still work on both a 5.0 project and a 6.0 project without there being any kind of conflict at the global level, um, which I think is uh, very, very good. So we're going to install these. Uh, it's going to go ahead and uh, give us this uh, cap binary. So this is how we're going to be interacting with the CLI. Um, let's see, do a quick little clear. And then we're going to do bun cap uh, init. So cap is just a quick little shorthand. We could do capacitor. Um, cap is just easier to type. Uh, and we're going to call init, which will create this new project for us. So what is the name of our app? This should be a super uh, human readable name. 
Um, it's basically what users are going to see in the App Store, and then also what they're going to see uh, when the app is installed on your device. So in this case, we'll call it JS Drops. Uh, a package ID. Package IDs are probably one of the more confusing parts of this. Um, they are basically a reverse domain specific uh, notation for your app. So if you had the pretty awesome domain of jsdrops.com, it would be com.jsdrops slash dot something else. Um, you kind of annotate it so that way each version of it just is a small kind of subdomain. Um, com.example.app com.jsdrop.app. Pretty, pretty standard format, although it does tend to trip people up because domains either can be, domains need to be specific to each app uh, that you are trying to build. So if for some reason someone on your team has already registered one uh, package ID uh, within your organization, you need to pick another one and people don't like com.app.example slash two. Uh, but we're going to stick with com.example.app uh, and it'll go ahead and say, okay, we created a capacitor config. Uh, it's going to be a TypeScript file for you. And then if you're not sure where you should go, here's some uh, docs to get you started. So let's go ahead and actually look at that capacitor config. We're not going to look at whatever that was. But we will look at this file. Now, uh, this file is going to basically take all of the um, different set uh, inputs that we just passed in. For example, our app ID, our app name, uh, this webder. Basically, where are all of our web assets getting built to? In this case, we're going to assume that we have a this folder that is going to have all of the output code for us. Uh, and then we're going to configure the Android uh, to load things up over HTTPS. Uh, so that way we have access to some pretty nice features. Um, this is all type safe. So if for some reason you wanted to go in here and say, uh, show me what else I could add, uh, your editor should be able to uh, autocomplete that and give you suggestions on different settings and stuff. So we're not going to focus too much on it other than uh, we might come back to update this just because I don't know where this uh, project is actually going to get built to, but we can close out of it and then come back to our, uh, our, our other terminal. In fact, let's do a quick little uh, reorganization over here. So let's actually just run, uh, run a quick little build. This way we can have everything uh, taken care of and we know where all of our assets are getting built to. So this is get pulling everything from dist. Um, good guess on our CLI. It knew where everything was getting built to. Now we want to take this and we want to do the bare minimum to deploy it to a device. Well, first we need to install the platform that we actually want to target. Um, I'm not going to attempt to do Android development. Uh, last time I did, uh, Android Studio decided it did not want to run. So I'm going to stick with iOS. Um, the process really is the same between both of them. Uh, but I'm going to install at capacitor iOS. It'll go ahead and install capacitor iOS for me, uh, but that's not all we need to do. Uh, we need to cap add iOS. Um, installing the platform and then adding the platform, you could figure out ways to uh, make that all one command, but it's not that much of a challenge to install the latest platform for, uh, beforehand. Uh, but what you do see is that we get this pretty nice output. So it went ahead and it created a native Xcode project for us. 
Uh, we'll look at that project in a second, but created a project for us. It copied the web assets from that disk folder into this new uh, directory called uh, public. It created a config file for us, and then it installed native dependencies with this pod command. So behind the scenes, like I said in the slides, it's using the native tooling that is uh, applicable to each platform. We're using CocoaPods to actually manage the dependencies that could be used in your native app. So if for some reason, if you are developing a plugin and you wanted to go ahead and actually use a third party dependency from CocoaPods, you would declare that in your pods file and then on installation of that package into somebody's project, it'll go ahead and fetch the dependencies for you without there needing to be um, some extra step needed to make sure that it works. Uh, this was something that was a pain in Cordova. Uh, and in React Native, you need to do this manual linking layer. Um, we, we handle that for you. But with that added, let's go ahead and uh, open our iOS project. We're going to open up an Xcode workspace. We'll see where we are with Xcode. Hey, it actually is loading pretty fast today. Um, I can't control, I think, the view of the actual UI. At least I don't think so. So we're just going to, you're just going to have to grin and bear it for now. Um, basically, all we have here is an actual, uh, an actual capacitor or an actual native project, right? We have all of the destination targets, how we want to uh, deploy this. So for instance, we can deploy this as a Mac app. Um, it'll just use the adaptive stylings for iPad. Uh, minimum deployment target for some reason, if you need to uh, deploy to anything older than 13, Probably don't, considering we're on 17, that's pretty far back. Uh, we could set up all the identity, all the stuff that we need for when we go ahead and submit it. We can handle all of our signing capabilities, which we're going to do real quickly. Um, we're just going to let uh, Xcode handle that for us. Um, we could also go in here if we wanted to add some sort of uh, entitlement. Uh, for instance, if we wanted to support Apple Pay or if we want to support background tasks or anything, really, all of these features can be implemented right inside of Xcode. Um, I gave Xcode a lot of uh, trash for being a confusing IDE. It actually has gotten a lot better in recent years and um, adding all of these uh, different features is much simpler than it used to be. Uh, but what we have on the side over here is our actual project structure. Uh, we have it split into the app itself and then any pods or any of the uh, utilities that we're using here. Uh, and we can actually expand some of this, take a look at what we're using. Uh, for example, this development pod gives us the capacitor native runtime where we can see all of the native files that we're using to actually author capacitor. Uh, and then some other utilities like a compatibility layer. If you are coming from Cordova and you want to adopt capacitor, but you still have all of these Cordova plugins, uh, there is a compatibility support system where those plugins will still operate. So you won't be left behind. Uh, and then the actual pod file here. Uh, this actually gets edited every single time uh, you go ahead and install a new dependency. Uh, if you want, all of these get added. And then you can also add your own custom CocoaPods, uh, as I said, for third-party dependencies. Now, on the app side of things, let's see what we got in chat. Uh, let's see, now on the app side of things, again, we have our app. We have our app delegate. And this is probably the most uh, Swift that we will really see. Uh, we're not going to dive too much into complex Swift uh, programming because 
I'll be honest, I'm not a Swift expert. I know enough to get myself into trouble and then enough to get myself out of it. But here we can see we have a few different lifecycle methods that we can take advantage of. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, application will resign active uh, sent when the application is about to move from active to an inactive state. All of these different hooks for when your app goes to uh, the background mode, when it comes back from the background mode, uh, when it is going to be in uh, kind of the app gallery mode, when you're like, if you're on iOS, you swipe up and you can see the entire uh, background processes. That's also a life cycle, uh, cycle hook that you can uh, activate. So all of these different things are available. We can start to integrate these into a project. Uh, we can actually see the main storyboard. So this is going to show us our bridge view controller. Uh, we can see our launch screen. So if we wanted to dive in and actually build a custom animated launch screen, uh, we could do that because we have full access to this native runtime, which is really great. But as I said, all this gets loaded up from the web view, you can see our main app, uh, the assets and all the JavaScript that we are pulling in. Uh, let's go ahead and actually just run some JavaScript or let's just run this. And we're going to run this on the ooh, 15 Pro. Let's go for the 15 Pro. And it's going to go ahead, run the actual builds for us in the background, uh, which is fantastic. We can see that we got our build succeeded and it's gonna install the app to our simulator running right over here. We're just gonna do some window management. Uh, Now, what we have down here, uh, this is one part of Xcode that I think is a little confusing is that they have all of these log windows kind of down here at the bottom, uh, kind of tucked away at first. But let's go ahead and see what we got. Uh, loading the app, it's going to load from this custom URL in this custom scheme. Uh, so all this is going to be capacitor colon slash slash localhost. Uh, so if you're doing any authentications or authentication service, you want to make sure that you actually uh, add this to your allow list. Um, and then we have our web view loaded, which now allows us to have our app over here. Uh, we can open up actual ad, uh, links to external resources, navigate back to it. And actually, if you look at that, we have the app name right up here in the top of the actual window. So this is a truly native app at this point. Uh, we can still interact with this. Click on the count, make sure everything works. We could do some window scrolling. We're going to actually get rid of that because uh, how often do you see an app doing that? But let's go back to our uh, editor over here um, and start to interact with some of these uh, native APIs. So we're going to install a plugin uh, and we will say at capacitor slash uh, status bar. And let me check my notes real quick. Nope, that's not the button I want to click. Okay. And this is why we have notes. Okay. Uh, so we just installed a package called status bar. Um, pretty self-explanatory. Status bar is going to go ahead and let us actually uh, interact with the device's status bar. Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what we are going to do is get rid of uh, this button. Uh, and we're going to go ahead uh, and say set status bar to 
Oh, we'll set it to light. And then we'll update this on click to be uh, toggle light status bar. I feel like using very long named functions today. So we're going to do that. Um, We'll go ahead and say const is going to equal an async function. Uh, and this async part is going to be important, um, but we're going to also import from at capacitor status bar. We're going to import two things. We'll import the status bar class itself and then the style, uh, which is the enum for uh, setting all these values. So we'll just say await uh, status bar dot set style and then we'll say uh style is going to be style dot uh yeah we'll do dark the thing that really throws me off here um and i don't know if what the decision was behind this is style dark is going to actually make the text light and style light is going to make the text dark uh, it feels like this was misnamed, um, but it's not a uh, argument that I will make with our team. So with this done, we can just do a bun run builds. Uh, let's see, what are we what are we complaining about? Oh, let's just. We'll get rid of that for now. It should still work. What are we complaining about over here? I hate to do this. We're going to go ahead and just complain. Fine, fine, fine. And then we'll say return. Does that fix it? Wow, this is actually humbling. This is the first time. What should it return? You can tell I work with frameworks a lot. Because you're, I think you're just doing this so we're engaged, right? Like, because <laughs> sure, solve the problem in the audience. <laughs> yeah, actually, audience participation. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and actually see what you get. We're gonna actually open up VS Code. You know, the problem is really, really uh, legit when I have to open up uh, VS Code. What can I just tell? Oh. Did Jamie solve it? Jamie, you are the hero of today. Woo! All right. Now we can go back to the real editor of them. If we just go ahead, I, I, t I tell you, sometimes all these errors and everything are really just VS Code or uh, ES Lint and TypeScript just being like, hey, you forgot to this import. Maybe don't include that. Anyway, uh, we're building now. It's running. That is a very humbling experience. Uh, but what we're going to do is run cap sync ios so we made a change to our actual web assets let's go let's go ahead and actually just sync those web assets to the native um project and you can see 
we picked up a new asset. Uh, so the status bar asset is actually going in to our project. So we need to fetch it and sync it with the native project. So you can see Xcode over here is uh, saying, hey, something's been modified. Let's go ahead and read from disk. And let's see what that actually did. So we have our pod file again. And you can see we have capacitor status bar. What's really, really nice here is that we are actually using node modules as our way of syncing these assets with the native app. So as you are building out uh, your app, and if you have, for instance, more plugins or more native uh, um, modules that you want to include, they're all just going to be pulled from node modules. So you're not having multiple dependency managers trying to say, this is where this asset is coming from. It's all being pulled from Node, uh, which is really, really consistent. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and actually run again on our project. It's going to go ahead and actually pull in uh, all of our dependencies. It's going to be, let's see, what are, where are we at? Cool. Build shouldn't taking too long. Uh, so dark background on the status bar. Let's go to light. Hey, it's already got. It's done. It's handled, and you can see we get this two native. Uh, we get this log of an actual call from the JavaScript to the native bridge, and then the JavaScript will then uh, return a value if that uh, function actually sends something back. In fact, let's go ahead and look at the status bar because the implementation for this is pretty simple. So I know I said I wasn't gonna dive into Objectives uh, into Swift, but this is actually not terrible. So here we have a function called set style, and then it gets an options from this uh, call variable that gets passed in. So we had our enum over here. Style dark is just going to be a, a short shortcut to the string of capital D A R K dark. Now we're just going to destructure. Uh, we're going to grab all those options in the style, and we're going to say if it's dark, set the uh, status bar style to light content. If it's light, set it to dark content. And if it's default, set it to whatever the default value should be uh, for, uh, for the native view. So if you're using something like dark mode, uh, it should use uh, light mode or the light style, uh, light content for the uh, status area. So all of these uh, calls are actually just simple call it and then I don't really care about any return values. And then when we want to go in and actually resolve it, because this is a promise, we have this call dot resolve. And then if we had anything that we wanted to pass back to the, um, uh, the system web view, we could go in and pass those inside of this resolve call. So all of our data, any serialization can be done and sent back to uh, our web view for us to then uh, render inside of our app. So this is all really, really nice. Let's go ahead and do a another um, uh, another method here. We're going to do fun install. And instead of the status bar, let's go ahead and go uh, geolocation. Uh, geolocation is a nice, nice little simple one that we can do. Um, we're going to go in and say const, uh, oh, how do we want to name this? Um, uh, position set position, and that's going to be use state. And then it's just going to be lat null or lat zero, uh, long zero. And we'll just call that. We'll just add our import for that. 
Now we'll say const get location is going to be again an async function. And then we'll say await geo location. And you see, we're just going to auto import that. Um, so that way we're not typing uh, everything out. We're going to say geolocation dot first check for permission. Uh, well, actually, first request permission. Uh, first, we want to make sure that we actually have uh, our hooks into the native device permission model. Uh, this is only needed because iOS and uh, Android are pretty strict about what features get exposed um, for, for proper reasons. So we'll just await request permission and then await uh, geolocation dot uh, get current position. And we'll say const, uh, we'll call this uh, pause equals await geolocation. And then we'd say set, uh, set position. And uh, we could say lat is going to be pause.coordinates.latitude. And then long is pause.coordinates dot longitude. So pretty simple uh, check permission, get the value and then set the value, um, which is really, really, really nice. Now we can go ahead and we're going to add another button down here. And on click, we're going to get what did I call it? Get location. Get location. Boards are and we'll just say oh JSON dot stringify uh, position null two uh, because I am I know how to format my JSON with JSON dot stringify. Okay, uh, all that is fun. Let's go in, do a quick little build again. We'll do our sync. Here we get our another uh, print of adding a dependency. Xcode will jump again, saying that we have something that needs to be handled. Uh, and then we get to interact with the fun part of iOS that isn't really fun, and that's info p list. Uh, info plist is just our way of saying, hey, we need to tell, uh, we need to be able to say this iPhone needs this feature for whatever reasons. So we're going to add a row here and it's going to be NS location always or location. Where are we? Uh, NS location always usage uh, just from the notes or privacy location always and when in use or is that yeah always usage uh, so basically, only allow this when uh, always allow this usage for description. And what the value is, is I always need to know where you are uh, just because. And then we'll add a new row and then say uh, privacy location when in usage. Uh, Please tell me where you are. And then let's go ahead and run this again. Not creepy at all. I mean, if you are a concerned parent, wouldn't you just want to have those descriptions? I always need to know where you are. So it'll go ahead and start to build. 
the sync of those old PSAs from uh, from the 90s. It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your kids are? Uh, let's go ahead and actually call this uh, method. We'll see we get actually integrated with the permission model. We're going to say uh, allow once. And then we're going to get back our actual uh, longitude and latitude. Now, this isn't my actual longitude and latitude. But if we look at the logs, we can see a lot of information here. One, we see the call to request permissions. Great. Now we can start to uh, confirm whether or not we want to actually show that. Location is granted. Course location is granted. Uh, if we were to actually destructure this or want to use this inside of our um, uh, JavaScript, this is the actual object that gets returned. So now we can start to code around that if for some reason location uh, permission has been rejected. Then we have our other JavaScript, uh, native call to get the current position. And then the timestamp, the coordinates, all of this data getting sent back to the app that we can now uh, use to build out our UI. So if you wanted to build your own version of Instacart or DoorDash, uh, you could do that and have all of the uh, location data from either the driver or for whatever and be able to uh, send that all in there. So let's see, where is the heading? This will actually give you the uh, 360 degree heading data so that way you can position like a car and just turn left down the road. Uh, actually pretty, pretty nice. If we looked at the actual pod for the capacitor geolocation, I only want to show this to show you all how the data gets returned back. Get current position. We're going to actually asynchronously call a function here. Uh, we're going to get the location data and then we're going to distribute it back. Now, this is a little bit more advanced. We are basically handling um, when that location gets sent. And then we have this queue that'll go ahead here in Location Manager and return the data. So get current position and then also watch position are going to make use of this same uh, of the same call. And then we can just return with the data after that data has been fetched and uh, manage that on the JavaScript side. So this is all nice and everything. Um, as I said, this is a little bit of an advanced Swift for me. I, for some reason, want to add a uh, custom uh, Swift. I want to write my own uh, my own little bit of native code. I'm going to promise that I won't go too deep, uh, but we are going to say uh, we're going to create a new file. And this is going to be a Swift file. And then where do we want to call this? Um, we're just going to call it. Oh, plugin dot Swift. Um, this is going to be for the actual app itself. And we're going to go ahead and uh, write our own code. So this shouldn't be too um, unfamiliar as we are uh, used to import statements. So let's import capacitor. Uh, this is going to give us the access to the runtime. So all of those call and those cat plugin values are going to be available here. And we can say uh, at object. It's going to be uh, our, uh, we're going to call it an echo plugin. And we're going to say public class uh, echo plugin. And it's going to be the type of a cap uh, plugin. And then it's going to have uh, a function called echo. And then inside of that, we're going to have the actual call itself. And that's going to be the cat plugin call type. And from there, we're going to say let value equal call dot get string. 
and it's going to be value or we'll just return nothing and then say call dot resolve and we're going to resolve a a value it's going to be set to value so excusing the uh unfamiliarity with swift basically we have our class called echo plugin we're going to decorate it with this at object annotation and it's going to be the type of an echo plugin and then we're going to have a function called echo that will get some sort of data from this call it's going to get something attached to this value object and then we're going to return that back to uh, whatever called this now with this we're going to create a new file here um, and we are going to create an objective c file uh, now objective c file we're going to excuse some of the uh, syntax here because it is actually uh, a little mm, not my not my forte uh, we're going to call it plugin.m uh, and we're going to leave it as an empty file and then uh, save it to this project. Don't create. And we're going to actually, I'm going to co just copy this for my notes just so that way I don't type anything bad. Uh, we have this annotation called cat plugin. And then we have the actual method. Uh, that we are registering. So this plugin.m is just a way to say, I have a plugin called echo plugin. You can see how these map back to the actual implementation detail. I have a plugin method called echo, which maps back to this actual function implement uh, that we have in the class. So all of this is just to connect what we wrote to um, uh, to the actual project. So let's save this for now. And we're going to actually add the JavaScript side of the house that we actually need. Um, in here, let's go ahead and add a, a plugin.ts. Uh, this is just going to be our plugin, and it's going to be what we interact with. So we'll say we'll import from capacitor core and we're going to import this register plugin call now this plugin call is going to be how we uh connect what we just wrote in swift to this uh javascript detail um so we're going to have say uh export interface because we are good developers we'll say echo plugin um and then that is going to have this echo function on it where it should have some options. Basically, we'll have value and that's going to be a type of a string. And then the return value of this is going to be a promise where we will return uh, the value itself. And that's also going to be a string. So we're just doing some typing right now. Nothing, nothing too uh, uh, out of the comfort zone and we'll actually export our echo, uh, plugin here. And we'll just say, uh, register plugin. And then we will say, uh, echo. And then it's going to be the echo plugin type. So that way all of these values, uh, get uh, picked up and then export default echo and now we have the echo plugin we have this registered echo value which when we come over to the swift side of the house or in the xcode we can see here is the cat plugin the name is echo the actual plugin implementation then maps back to here and it's a very, uh, a very consistent and uh, I would say seamless uh, way to go from here's a JavaScript 
to the native, and here's the native back to the JavaScript. So we'll save this, and we'll come back over to our app, and we're going to create another button uh, on click. And I will say echo val. Uh, echo the value. And then let's just go ahead and implement this. Oh, it gave me a function. We all know it should just be arrow functions all the way down. Um, now we can actually go ahead and uh, use this plugin. So let's import uh, echo from uh, from this plugin file, and then we will say uh, await echo dot echo, uh, and we're going to give it the value of foo. And then we can say const return echo equals that. And then console.log return echo. So we're going to echo the value of foo, and we're going to capture it. And then we're going to log the return value from that, which will also just be, uh, oh, we'll just give it the full object. Let's do a quick little build. We'll do our sync. We'll come back over to Xcode and let's try to run this and see what works and if anything breaks. We'll wait for, for Xcode to do its thing. It's thinking, it likes to take its time. So all this is up and running, and let's go ahead and just say echo the value. And we just called custom native code. So you can see we have the two native call, and we can pick up the actual uh, call value right, or the call number right there. And then we're going to then return the value of foo. And then here's our log. Uh, we just actually log that out. And if we wanted to, we could go over to, um, where? We're gonna try to see if this is actually gonna work. Yeah, we are a native Swift developer, which I, I wouldn't call myself a native Swift developer, but hey, you know what? I wrote some Swift and it didn't break. So now that all of this has kind of been set up, we can actually start to move this over. And uh, you know what? Let's let's see. What are we at for time? Let's actually just try to do the uh, uh, the Android version. I was I wasn't going to, but I, I'm feeling ambitious. Uh, actually, let's take a look at some questions that we've got right now. Um, uh, the dev flow is quite slow as each change requires a build and sync, but I guess it speeds up as the cost. Um, and then similar question, uh, is there a live reload functionality? So yeah, all of this can be done with a live reload, uh, functionality. So let's actually do that. Um, do, 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 do. We are going to manage some windows real quick. Uh, let's make sure I have my actual uh, notes set up for this. Jamie has an idea as a Jamie's James in it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's great. It means people are paying attention. Oh, uh, library load. Okay. So you could use a few different options here. 
Uh, we're going to actually go ahead and say uh, bun run dev, and this will give us our actual uh, network here that we're going to use. Um, then we can come over to the capacitor config, and then we're going to go over to the server and say for the URL, go and actually um, do the, actually, can we just paste that? Yeah, uh, we'll actually need to get our, um, uh, our IP address. I'm gonna do that over here. And then, eh, you're gonna see it anyway. And I can always scramble that. So we've basically are starting our dev server here, setting the app to actually pull that in for the, uh, uh, for the URL and then clear text to be true. And now we can say do MPX or bun cap sync iOS. So it'll sync all these assets for us. Reload from disk. And then we'll run. And if we do everything right, ooh, could not connect to the server. Oh, why does that not want to work? I do know why that did not want to work. Uh, we need to run post because. There we go. That should be everything. Uh, let's try that one more time. Because someone forgot to expose that. Okay. Uh, so here's the app it's up and running. Let's go ahead and, you know, instead of console.log, we'll just do an alert. Cool. Now we're actually uh, now we're actually getting a live uh, reload, so we can delete that. We can actually just delete all of this um, if we want to go ahead and instead of so you get position quartz. Let's move these down here, and we can say uh, instead of using a paragraph tag, let's go ahead and use a pre tag. And then we will paste our coordinate data. Just that way we can have a nice little formatting. Uh, get position, allow once. And here we go. It's all formatted nice and uh, good. Now, I will say this is something that uh, manually it's kind of a pain to do. Uh, we are looking into getting this built into that uh, CLI. So that would let you run all of the stuff um, from cap run iOS, and then you would have this dash dash live reload flag. It's not out yet. Uh, if you are using this with Ionic, we kind of built that already for you, so you could do that. Uh, but it also brings up the question of, well, if you have all of this up and running, you want to comment those out but you didn't want to open up um, Xcode for whatever reason. Well, you just do bun run or bun cap run iOS. We'll go ahead and try to build everything for you. And then we have a utility that will go in and actually sync uh, um, all of your actual simulators that you have installed and say, hey, which simulator do you want to uh, use? You could do this pro, you could do this pro. I'm going to go for that one, and it's going to run Xcode build behind the scenes for you. So this is the same command that actually Xcode is running when I click the build button. It's just going to run that directly from the command line, so that way we don't necessarily need to go in uh, install anything extra or run another app. Uh, we can just have that be deployed. And then there you go. It's already up and running. Uh, in fact, that was so fast. We're going to 
We're going to do that again. Because I didn't believe it. Now, builds with Xcode are actually, uh, wow, it actually is that fast. Um, builds with Xcode build are actually cached. So this first one um, that we had, uh, the one that we previously tried to run took a little bit. This one actually just took like three seconds. So as you are building your app, um, if you feel like it's slow the first time, uh, it's just building a cache for you. Now, I did say I wanted to do the uh, Android version. Uh, read from disk. Let's go ahead and just close all of that. And let's go ahead and add Android real quick. See if I can do that. Bun, uh, bun install at capacitor Android. Bun cap add Android. Now, what's nice here is that it's using the same method for actually. Ooh, yeah, this is what I was thinking. I don't have my Android environment set up correctly. So what we're having here is just a quick little bug with Android. Um, so went ahead it tried to install all of the dependencies and sync them with the native Android project. Did that actually create a hey, did cap open Android? It did actually create the project for us. So we're going to see if we can salvage this real quick. Uh, we're going to trust this project. Now, if you've used any IntelliJ product or any uh, JetBrains product, this should feel familiar. Uh, we're going to do our little update. Hopefully this is what actually was the build error. Let this good that ran and let's try to run this on. Uh, we'll go for pixel six. Get rid of that. Zoom in a little bit more. We are truly flying by the seat of our pants right now. I I'm actually very uh, unsure if this will work, but we're going to see. Where is our build output? Build successful. There we go. And then, hey, look, our app is running. Uh, calls to the status bar actually work. We could get the coordinates and location. We just need to add the uh, actual. Go ahead and do that. Uh, much like iOS has their own um, ways of managing permissions, so does Android. Uh, what we're basically doing is using these permissions to say, hey, Android, let us have access to location, GPS, and then courts and find location data. So we'll stop, try to run this again. And then get data. Oh, allow only this time. We can give it approximate, precise. And then those coordinates should be printed back in a second. Either way. This is working. Perfect. Awesome. So I didn't even expect the Android version to actually work, but it did just fine. And then, hey, there's our Latin longitude printed in the button. Um, so we're kind of at a time for now, and I see there is yeah. still some chatter in the chat. I guess let's go over that. <laughs> um, two outstanding questions. Uh, I saw that geolocation offers a watch method. How are the events? Uh, how are the information streams sent back as events, callback as web streams? 
Uh, so in that case, location data actually gets sent back as a series of callbacks. Um, if we were to swap this out as uh, instead of doing oh wait geolocation, we'd we'll have a uh, watch ID. And then we would say watch position. And then we'd have, uh, I think it would be a location and then any errors. Uh, it would be sent back as callbacks and then you would hopefully be updating that. Um, and then on whatever on destroy or uh, clean up callback that your framework of choice has, uh, you would just clear that watch passing in this uh, watch ID um, in that. So uh, yes, callbacks for this, uh, you could do another approach, but callbacks work just fine. And then the following question, uh, am I right to say that plugin files are actually saved in the Xcode project and are not saved in the project repository? Yes and no. So all of those files that I made in Xcode are part of this iOS directory. Uh, so we could actually go ahead and open them up in Vim if we wanted to. Uh, all of the projects that we were made that we made inside of Xcode get included to your project repo, which includes the iOS project, the Android project, and then your actual web project. So yeah, it, it does depend. Uh, it depends on your definition of project. Uh, but basically, if we were to make this whole thing a Git repo, all that source code would be included, which uh, alleviates one of the big pain points that Cordova had where um, customizations weren't persisted uh, from my computer to your computer to somebody else's computer. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I just want to, I just want to say that you're a very brief person. You did an update live and you ran something that you knew was broken and it worked. So you have my respect. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I don't know how it worked, but we're going to uh, we're going to say that the demo gods uh, were in my favor today. <laughs> you always make it seem so chill, you know, it's like you can really tell. I, I feel like you can really like live coding and issues. You know, it can be interesting or it can be really, really traumatizing to watch. So your live code. I'm not traumatizing. So that yes. <laughs> that makes me feel not, a little it was bit not better. Not traumatizing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now that was a lot of fun. So Mike, where do we find out like more information or content? Yeah. Or like what are what are the next steps? So if you want to learn some more information, you can actually just go to capacitorjs.com. Um, it'll give you a nice kind of overview of how to get started whether you just want to go ahead and use NPM and install it into an existing project, as well as see some uh, sample code that you could go over, uh, as well as our pretty awesome plugin that we could have uh, used inside of the project. Um, if you're coming from a different framework of choice, we have guides and detail uh, integration stories for all of those, or you could just do what I do and go to the docs and walk through the setup, the tutorials, um, basically have everything kind of handed to you. Yay, awesome. And don't forget, you can follow Mike on Twitter at M Hardington. He's hanging out there. Um, he does other things, so, you know. Build guitars. Yeah. <laughs> so if you need help with this or you need a guitar build, you know where to find Mike. <laughs> um, thank you so much again, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. This program is presented by This.Labs, the framework agnostic consulting firm helping enterprises realize their technical goals through staff augmentation, consulting, project management, on-demand subject experts, training, and other professional services. Find out more at this.labs.com.